I was having lunch with Lon a couple of weeks ago who faithfully pastored this church for 37 years. And I was so encouraged. Uh, yeah, praise God for... And so I was just asking him all kinds of questions about those 37 years, like ups and downs along the way. And some people here have been here for many of those years, some more than Lon was. I think about Betty Wright, who I was talking with recently. She, one of the five founding families who came together and started NBC over 50 years ago. Bob and Joyce Roundy are here at Tyson's today. Bob's parents, Will and Mary, were one of those founding families. So all this to say, whether you've been here for decades or you're brand new to this church, we have a pretty awesome heritage. Right, from five families to campuses and churches of well over 10,000 people spread across our nation's capital. But I wanna ask a question today. What if our best days as a church are ahead of us, not behind us. I was so struck when we read Deuteronomy a few weeks ago now, and Moses, after all that he had seen in his life and his leadership, he prayed and he said, oh Lord God, you have only begun to show your servant your greatness and your mighty hand. And what if God has only started to show his greatness, and his mighty hand through McLean Bible Church. I was so encouraged talking with Alon. He, he shared how he wanted to transition because he believed God has so much more for the church and the future, and he was ready to pass the torch on to leaders with vision for that future. So all of this was on my mind as I read Proverbs 16, 1 through 9 this week. So follow along with me there. This is the word of God. Proverbs 16, 1, the plans of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. All the ways of a man are pure in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the spirit. Commit your work to the Lord and your plans will be established. The Lord has made everything for its purpose, even the wicked for the day of trouble. Everyone who is arrogant in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Be assured he will not go unpunished. By steadfast love and faithfulness, iniquity is atoned for. And by the fear of the Lord, one turns away from evil. When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. Better is a little with righteousness than great revenues with injustice. The heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. Now, oh, there is a simple truth in this section of Proverbs that is significant for every one of our lives. You might write it down in those notes that hopefully you received on the back of the bulletin when you came in. Here's the simple truth. Proverbs 16, one through nine. It is wise to make plans that aim for God's glory. Verse two, all the ways of a man are pure in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the spirit. So motives matter when we're making plans. Verse three says, commit your work to the Lord. Commit your work to God for his sake. Just, just think for a moment about plans you make in your life, your family, your work. Is your driving motivation the glory of God? Like more than your comfort, more than a bottom line, more than the goals or aims that the world might put in front of us. Is your driving motivation the glory of God, like, God, I am planning, I am strategizing for your glory. How can I best spend my time, my money, all the resources you've given me for your glory? How can I, God, can I, how can I best glorify you in my singleness? God, how can I best glorify you in the way I love my spouse? God, how can I best glorify you in my parenting? Not do what the world around me says I should do with parenting. Like, how can I best glorify you as a mom or a dad with this child? Or as a child, how can I guess best glorify you, God, with the way I relate to my parents? Do you plan, strategize? Like, this week, each day when you wake up in the morning, God, how can 
I best, most glorify you. Verse seven, when a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. It is wise to make plans that aim for God's glory, that align with God's purpose. So verse four, the Lord has made everything for its purpose, and the purposes of God here include fearing him, turning from evil, living for righteousness and justice. Verse eight, so we make plans that align with God's purposes. And if we're not careful, let's be honest, we can come up with all kinds of plans that seem good to us, right in our own eyes, like verse two says. But that is an unwise way to live. Living according to what looks best to us is foolishness. Wisdom asks, what are the purposes of God in the world and how can I align my life with those purposes? It will change your life when you ask that question. God, what are your purposes in the world and how can I align my life and my family with your purposes? It's wise to make plans that aim for God's glory, align with God's purpose, and ultimately yield to God's sovereignty, meaning we make plans humbly. Verse nine, the heart of man plays his, plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. So sometimes life doesn't go as we planned. And when that happens, what do we do? We trust the sovereignty of God as we continue aiming for his glory and aligning with his purposes. So it's wise to plan like this in our lives. And then, so don't you think it's wise for us to do this together as a church? If we're not careful in our culture, even in our church culture, we can be so individualistic or we're so focused on what is best for each of us instead of stopping and thinking what's best for all of us like together as the body of Christ. This is the way the Bible talks. 1 Corinthians 12, 27. You are the body of Christ and individually members of a bigger picture in such a way that verse 26, right before that in 1 Corinthians 12, says if one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. I don't think we always think this way. That if another member of the body is suffering, we all suffer with them. I think we're dangerously, subtly prone to look out for ourselves, even to isolate ourselves. Proverbs 18.1 warns us against that. Whoever isolates himself seeks his own desire and breaks out against all sound judgment. It's unwise, in other words, to isolate yourself, to seek your own desire. And I would argue that we've actually created a whole church culture in our country that caters to our own desires. Like, come to this church where you'll hear the music you like and the sermons that meet your needs. You almost walk out thinking, I'll give that a five today or a six or a one. Programs that cater to your comforts. If you ever get dissatisfied, start complaining. If that doesn't work, find yourself another place that fits your preferences. All this to say, it's wise for us to think not just about plans individually as Christians, but together like we're part of a body. We are made for community, which is the why the Bible beckons every follower of Christ to commit your life to a local church. Whether it's this one or another one, you commit yourself to a community where you work together. You plan, not just as individuals, but as a community, together in ways that aim for God's glory, align with God's purposes, and trust in God's sovereignty. So as we read these verses in Proverbs, it's wise for us to think about the plans God has for our church, for us together. Like, why are we here? We obviously don't have to come together like this. There are all kinds of other things people in the world are doing today, even other professing Christians. Heather was sharing the gospel this week with a service technician who came to our house for some electrical work, and he said, I'm a Christian, but I just don't want anything to do with organized religion. And as they talked, Heather said, I totally get some of the reasons why you say that. And actually agree with some, many of those reasons. But if you're a follower of Jesus, don't you want to gather together to worship God and encourage and serve other people in the body of Christ and work together to spread his love in the world? I thought, way to go, babe. Because that is, that's why we're here. This is what we're doing together. Our mission, what is God calling us to do? As a church, specifically as McLean Bible Church, God is calling us to glorify him by making disciples and multiplying churches among all nations 
beginning in greater Washington, D.C. And I hope you see in those words exactly what we just saw in Proverbs, that aim for God's glory, align it with God's purpose, to see disciples made, churches multiplied among the nations. Like, we know this is the purpose of God. We know that God will be glorified when disciples, men and women, children, are growing to become more and more like Jesus. You think about it. The more we look like Jesus, the more we love like Jesus, the more God is glorified in us. And not just in us, because again, it's not just about us. But the more others look and love like Jesus, the more God is glorified in the world. So we make disciples and we multiply churches. The more gatherings there are of men and women who are glorifying God, the more God is getting glory in the world. Starting right here in Washington, D.C., where we live, and spreading out from here. Which, by the way, this emphasis on the nations, especially people and people groups who've never heard the gospel, is not new at NBC. So the Roundies, who I mentioned earlier, who are here today, Will and Mary Roundy, so the parents of Bob and Joyce who are here, six years after founding this church, Will and Mary went out as missionaries from McLean Bible Church. This founding couple, he had two years left in his government job until retirement. And God said, now's the time to go. And they left and they moved into a remote tribe where the gospel had never gone and lived in a mud hut with dirt floors. Will was 50 at the time. So 50-year-olds, it's never too late to go. There are mud huts and dirt floors just waiting for you all around the world. And, and then decades later, so today, three of the Roundy's children and families have missionaries that are still being supported by McLean Bible Church as they spread the gospel in unreached places. All this to say, this mission is not new. It's not just some statement we just made up. This is what God made up. I don't, I don't want to be a part of a vision I made up or anybody else makes up. You make up. Like, I want to be a part of God's vision. And this is what God calls every follower of Christ to do, to be in a church that's glorifying him by making disciples and multiplying churches among the nations, beginning right where we live. But we have a problem. And this is where I really want to open up my heart to you. Some of you may remember a year or so ago now, we took a survey on a Sunday morning. We just passed it out here at all of our campuses and we asked some questions to see how we were doing in our mission. And in that survey, in those questions, this was really important for me as I was just starting to get a picture of where things are and that survey proved to be really humbling and really helpful because it exposed a problem. And I wanna summarize that problem with three statistics that I want to share with you today that I hope will be a wake-up call for us together as a church. So I put these in your notes so you can write them down, soak this in. So one of the questions we asked on the survey was, how well do you feel like people know you at NBC? And the answer was 11% of those who took the survey feel like people know them at NBC. Now let me give one caveat here. The numbers I'm using here are from our Tyson's campus, so our largest campus. So these numbers aren't exact for every campus, but I would say they're indicative of the church at large across all of our campuses. 11% said they felt known at their church. The second statistic that stuck out, 43% of those who took the survey said they are growing either a little spiritually or not at all. So almost half of people sitting in here on a Sunday, said they are growing either a little spiritually or not at all. And then the third statistic here, 62% said that they hardly ever, if ever, share the gospel. That was defined as less than two times over the last year. So the majority of people on a Sunday have shared the gospel either one or zero times over the last year. So when you put all this together, you realize that as the church, like we have a problem when only 11% of people say they feel known at church. And almost half of us are growing either a little spiritually or not at all. When almost two-thirds of us have hardly ever, if ever, shared the gospel. These statistics shout to us that we have a problem and we need a plan Together, so follow along your notes, we need a plan to care for one another, 
like we're a family. Which is how the Bible describes the church, the family, the household of God. You look in the New Testament, you will see 59 one another commands. Love one another, serve one another, encourage one another, honor one another, bear with one another, care for one another. We're not going to go all 59, but do all these things to one another like a family, like deeper than family. I think about members of this church who don't have any physical family who are followers of Jesus. The church is designed to be a family. And it's pretty simple. You can't be a family that cares for one another if you don't know one another. Now the obvious challenge here is that there are thousands of members in this family. There's no way for any one of us to know everyone else. But certainly every family. Every member of this family needs to be known and cared for by others in the church. And when only 11% say that's the case for them, this shouts, mayday, mayday, we have a problem. And obviously statistics don't always tell the whole story. We have a whole lot of other information we don't have time to get into during this sermon. I'll just say this. I love you, church. I, I, I woke up, God... I'm going to blame it on God. God woke me up this morning earlier than I'd planned. I thought I'd planned to wake up pretty early, but I woke up earlier than that. And just, I woke up praying for you. Like, you were on my mind. Like, I was just thinking. I woke up thinking about struggling lives in this church. I woke up thinking about people who I know are battling with sin, people who are walking through trials. I woke up thinking about struggling marriages in this church that are on the brink of coming to an end. Wayward kids and parents whose hearts are breaking over them. And there's people walking through this sickness, that trial, and like we need a plan to care for every single person in this family. Like, and not just like Okay, if we could just get to 75%, that'd be good. Like, no. I have, I have four kids, and Lord willing, one other on the way through adoption. But four kids right now. If, if, if you were to keep my kids for a night, and I were to come home, and you were to be like, well, we, we, we got three of them taken care of. One's lost, we're really not sure where they are. But 75%. I don't even want to imagine what I want to do to you at that moment. When you speak those words, like, are you serious? God, our Father, cares for every single person. I'm looking at right now, people, I can't even see a different camera. He cares for every single one of you. It is not tolerable for 11% to say, I feel known and cared for in the church. We need to plan to care for every single person person like family and along with that we need to plan to grow in Christ likeness like we're a gymnasium now that might sound a bit odd to you you might think a gymnasium some of you have no desire to be in a gym right now but the reason I use this word is because the Bible uses this word first Timothy chapter 4 verse 7 and 8 the Bible says train yourself for godliness for while bodily training is of some value Godliness is a value in every way. And the word there for train yourself in the original language of the New Testament is gymnazo, from which we get gymnasium. And the picture is clear. God calls every one of us to train our hearts and our minds to follow Christ. And if almost half of us are not growing spiritually, we need to be a better spiritual gymnasium. Like there's a craze in our culture today to get fit in this way or that way. And some, some of that's good, really good. It's good to be physically fit, but this body is only gonna last for a little while. We need a craze in the church to be spiritually fit because that's what matters forever. And not just for us. Like, people's lives are at stake for all of eternity based on hearing and seeing this gospel alive in us. So we need a plan to make disciples of all nations like we're on a mission. I, mean, I mentioned many people will be scattering this summer to go on mission trips, which is so awesome. I love it. One of my hopes for those trips is that in working together as a team on a trip, people will realize this is what the church does. 
But we don't just do this for a week here or there around the world. We do this right here. As the church, we're a team on a trip in this world every week. We're making disciples together this week in this city where God has placed us. And we go and we make disciples in places where God leads us, both and. It doesn't make sense to be on a mission trip somewhere else or right here and never share the gospel, which is the case for the majority of us. And I don't say that to make us, you, feel guilty, but to help us see like, something needs to change here. You put all this together. If we're not caring for each other, growing in Christ and sharing the gospel so that other people can be saved from their sins for all of eternity, something is off. Like these are not obscure things that the church may or may not do. These are the primary things a church must do. Like this is what we exist for. And if these things aren't happening, we desperately need to rethink how we're doing things. And we need to make some major changes. Which leads in your notes to our map. So how is God calling us to accomplish this mission then? I think about my father-in-law who was in town not long ago with his wife and they were wanting to go down to the district but they were pretty nervous about navigating the metro and the mall and the museums. So I drew a customized map like handwritten with instructions here and there to help them get where they were going. So what's our map? How do we get to where we're caring for one another like family and growing in godliness like a gymnasium and working together on mission in the world? And as soon as I ask that question, I immediately think about dangers we need to avoid, like doing everything we can. Think about that map for my in-laws. What I did not do was put every single detail, every single thing in the district, because there's no way they could do it all. And if we're not careful as a church, we can try to do it all, all kinds of things here and there, have like a menu of all kinds of ministries. But if we're not careful in our efforts to do everything we can, we won't do anything well. So just because we can do this or that doesn't mean God is calling us to do this or that, which means we also need to avoid the danger of continuing to do everything we've ever done. Let's just realize the obvious. We're doing things differently today than the founders of this church did 50 years ago when they started. The basics are obviously the same, what we see in the Bible, but how we do it, so many factors have changed, which means we don't just do what we've always done. And when we make changes or do things different, that doesn't mean that what we did in the past, what we were doing was bad. We trust that was right at that time, but we always ask God, what is the best way to glorify you in the present? Which leads to another danger, Settling for the good and sacrificing the best. Again, there are all kinds of good things we can do that we can give ourselves to. This is true in all of our lives, right? I can think of all kinds of good things I can do this week that will actually pull me away from quality time with my wife and my kids that I need to have. It'll pull me away from the job that I know God has called me to do and so on. We're surrounded by good things that we don't need to do. So if we only ask, well, what's bad about this or that, we'll never get anywhere because there's often nothing bad about this or that, but that doesn't mean it's the best way for us to glorify God. Right now, there are all kinds of good things we have going on as a church. But meanwhile, we're missing some of the best things, some of the most needed things. Which leads to this next danger, thinking that more is always better than less. We often think the more stuff, so the more activities, programs, events we have and offer, the greater impact we'll have, when that can actually lead us to be so scattered among all sorts of different things that we lose focus on the few things that are most important. In other words, less is actually sometimes better than more. And we must beware of thinking that fast is always better than slow. This is the way things so often work in our culture. We want a quick fix, right? We want to get fit fast. We want to get rich fast. We want to get this or that fast. So we engineer and advertise all kinds of ways to do it. And then we think, why can't we just do that in the church? Like, what's the book I need to read? The study I need to do? The program I need to get involved in? Do this, do that, and all your problems will be solved. But ladies and gentlemen, it doesn't work that way. And you can't microwave disciples. Last year for my birthday, Heather got me a smoker to smoke meat on. And I've learned to put a brisket on there and give it 12, 14 hours to smoke and it comes out so juicy. 
You don't microwave brisket. <laughs> so when you think disciple making, don't think a microwave. Think a smoker. We are smoking disciples. <laughs> Maybe a better analogy <laughs> would be parenting. Raising children doesn't happen in a week or a month. It takes years, right, of hard work. <laughs> Heather and I are looking at each other like our oldest is 13. We'll likely have a toddler on the way through this adoption. And like we're starting over again. And, <laughs> and, and we're looking and we're, we're, not, we're not coming to the point where we think teenage years are easier than the toddler years. <laughs> like, and I see heads nodding all across the room right now of people who have adult children who think it just doesn't doesn't end and that's kind of the point making disciples is like this and so it's multiplying churches like there's no six week class for this we, we want there to be like a silver bullet but it doesn't exist there's no like two month fast track to being the church and all that it needs to be this is why the Bible actually warns against fast at points think about what Paul says to Timothy don't be quick to lay hands on elders. Take your time, 1 Timothy 5, 22. Or what's the saying we know? Rome wasn't built in a day. Apparently, it takes time to create great things. You lay a quick foundation, sloppy first row of stones, the rest of the building will be compromised forever. I'm dwelling on this reality for a reason, because it goes totally against the grain of the way we think, and we need to think differently. We need to avoid all these dangers, and we need to ask the question together, how can we most faithfully and effectively accomplish our mission? Together, like, what's our map for how we're gonna faithfully follow God's word and effectively carry out this mission in the time and place God has put us in? Not 50 years ago, or not even last year, but today and in the days to come. And this is where, in a minute, I'm actually gonna turn off this feed to other campuses, because yes, asking this question as a church, but there are unique dynamics at each campus, and I wanna hand things off in a minute to different campus pastors to help answer this question at each campus. That actually leads to a question I've had many people ask me. They say, I see that we're all about multiplying churches. Does that mean our campuses will become churches at some point? And my answer is at any point, leaders across this church and each campus believe that the best way to carry out this mission is in a specific campus becoming a church, then we will do that. But that's not a decision that's made in isolation. It's a process with leaders in the church, leaders at each campus seeking God, discerning together, and asking, how can we most faithfully and effectively accomplish our mission? That's the question that drives us. No matter where we are, what campus, no matter how long we've been in the church, little while, a long while, we all lay down our preferences, plans, our desires, and we ask God, how can we together right now most faithfully and effectively glorify you by making disciples and multiplying churches among the nations starting right here? Now, that leads to 1 Kings chapter 18. You've got to see this. So turn with me over there. 1 Kings chapter 18. And while you're turning, I want to introduce you to two people who I want you to know when it comes to how we're doing this as a church together. So one is a brother named Dave Young. So long story short, Marissa, a big fan of Dave Young. Uh, so Dave was very successful in business. Uh, quite frankly, made a lot of money uh, building and consulting businesses. And along the way came faith in Christ, in large part through this church as an adult, eventually came on staff, was serving out at the Montgomery County campus as I started to get to know him more over the last year or so. And I've asked Dave to come alongside me and use his gifts, the brother is brilliant, to lead out in how this mission plays out across every bit of this church. The, the best thing I can say about this brother is, yes, he is brilliant, extremely gifted, but far more important, uh, he loves Jesus. Anybody who knows Dave knows a man who humbly walks with God and loves the church. He loves this church and wants this church to be all that God desires it to be. So Dave was up in, in New York a day this last week learning from a church and ministry there about making disciples among unreached peoples in cities like New York and D.C. And I asked him to shoot a quick video introducing himself and this is what he sent me. Watch this. Hey guys, David asked me to send over a, 
a video, so I thought I'd say hi on my way over to Penn Station. Um, some of you may recognize me because I've been at McLean Bible Church for almost 20 years, and I, uh, I got saved largely through the ministries of McLean Bible Church. And it has been so good to be at MBC. Some of my, some of my best friends today, whoa, don't want to get hit by this car. Some of my best friends today are from, I met at McLean Bible, and some of my favorite memories are from McLean Bible. Uh, very special church. And we are seeing some amazing things happening at NBC today and some pieces falling into place that make me think, man, NBC's best years of ministry feel like they're in front of us and not behind us. And that is cool to think about. So I'm here to say that I am really looking forward to being McLean Bible Church with you guys. And I think it's going to be so much fun. And undoubtedly, a few bumps along the way, maybe a U-turn or two, but so good for sure. And I'm really looking forward to it. And we'll see you soon. Thanks. So that's Dave Young risking his life to see this mission accomplished at NBC. Like I said, Dave. I, you stopped at the end of the video and you just started talking. You, you, didn't, you didn't have to walk across crosswalks in New York City while doing the video. I was not asking you to risk your life. So anyway, that's Dave Young. Then the second person I want to introduce you to is Scott Logsdon. So I met Scott and his wife, Cindy, years ago, uh, served alongside them when I was at the International Mission Board where they were missionaries in Central Asia uh, for many years in a country uh, where it's really, really hard to get the gospel to a good pastor friend of mine summed up Scott and Cindy when he said, not, not that we compare, but Scott and Cindy are the sharpest missionaries I've ever seen overseas. And by God's grace, we already have so much going on when it comes to global outreach. Great staff, volunteer leaders, many of you working for the spread of the gospel among the nations. And Scott and Cindy last week committed to come to NBC to lead our work among the nations, starting right here in D.C. Scott's actually from this area, along with Cindy, who's from close to Manassas. So I asked them to send a video, and they sent a nice, peaceful, non-life-threatening video. So let me introduce you to Scott and Cindy. Hey, McLean Church family. My name is Scott Logson, and this is my wife, Cindy. And we just want to say how excited we are to be a part of this church family. For the past 17 years, we've been serving with the International Mission Board with our two daughters. And 12 of those years, we served as missionaries in a Central Asian country. And there, we saw that what God says in his word in Psalm 148 is absolutely true. That everywhere that we've been, we've seen that the earth is full of the glory of God. As we've watched his amazing work among the nations as he draws men and women and children to himself. And now we're passionate about seeing every member of the church equipped and mobilized to play a role in making disciples of all the nations, beginning right here in Washington, D.C. Our prayer is simply that every member of the McLean Church family, from every age group and every group in the church, that everyone would play a significant role in God's work among the nations. We can't wait to join you in that work. Birds chirping, calm, peaceful. So there will be plenty of opportunities for you, uh, even at different campuses, to get to know these guys in the uh, days, years ahead. Today, they're actually running around the building right now uh, in meetings at work, making disciples. And that's the picture. So each of them, Dave, Scott, Cindy, myself, campus pastors, and every single one of us. That's what I appreciate about what Scott said. Every member of the body working together to glorify God according to his plan. And the beauty is, well, this is why I want us to close in 1 Kings 18, because God promises to bless people who are committed to his plan. He promises to bless them with his power. So, Elijah and the prophets of Baal. Let me summarize the setup for the sake of time. So you got Elijah and 450 prophets of Baal. So Baal was the false god of the Canaanites who they believed could bring rain from the sky. 
Then you had 400 prophets of Asherah on top of that. So that's one Elijah versus 850 false prophets. Odds not looking good. And Elijah says, I want you to see that there is only one true God. They said, game on. So they set up an altar and the prophets of Baal cried out for hours for Baal to bring down fire from heaven and nothing happened. You look right in the middle, uh, verse 27. Uh, this is called Old Testament trash talk. At noon, Elijah mocked them saying, cry aloud. For Baal is a God, either he is musing or he is relieving himself. He just said that. <laughs> relieving himself? He's on a journey, perhaps he's asleep and must be awakened? So the lesson is clear. When you pray to a God who is not there, do not expect an answer. So after all this, for hours goes on, Elijah steps up and he says, let's pour some water around this altar. Let's do it again. Let's do it a third time. So it's soaked with water. And then you get down to verse 36. In the time of the offering of the oblation, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant, that I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God and that you have turned their hearts back. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Oh, so much here. But let me just point this out. The same God who sent Fire from heaven in this story is the same God we have gathered to worship right now. Uh, the same God who showed his power on this day is the same God over McLean Bible Church today. The same God. And this same God, so you might think, well, what, what is this all we walk through have to do with my life? This same God wants to show his power in our lives, in our families, in our city, in this world today. So I guess the question is, do we want that? This is the last part of your notes, and I actually want to change it into a question that I want to us to ask together, do we want to see God work in our lives, our families, our city, and the world in a way that can only be explained by his power? Do we want this? Or do we want to settle for status quo in the church? We just kind of go in week by week by week with monotonous religious motion that misses out while Half of us growing a little spiritually, most of us not really feeling known, not sharing the gospel. I mean, like, no, we were created for so much more than this. We want to see God's power in our lives, in our marriages, in our families, in this city, in the world. Like Deuteronomy 3:24, oh Lord God, you've only begun to show your servant your greatness in your mighty hand. We want to see God work in a way that can only be explained by his power and can only be attributed to his glory. Huh. I love the glory of God. I love this church, and I long to see every single one of our lives and our life together experiencing all that God has for us. So I want to say to us as a church today, let's long together to see God work in a way that can only be explained by his power and only be attributed to his glory. I, 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 was, I, I was up in New York this last Tuesday night at Brooklyn Tabernacle to observe their prayer service. And I was just reminded of story after story after story of lives changed, people who were addicted to this or that, totally uh, freed from that addiction. Marriages changed, families changed, church changed in the middle of Brooklyn, New York. And I was just praying, and it's, it's no coincidence uh, we didn't necessarily plan it this way. I wasn't planning to do this today, but we planned this Friday night for us to have another one of our late night prayer gatherings. Like, let's ask God together to work in our lives and our families and in this city and in this world through this church in a way 
that we sit back and say, only God could have done that. So will you, will you pray with me, and then I'll turn it over to other campuses. Oh, oh God, we're serious. We want to see your glory. We, we need your help, your grace, your mercy, God, in our lives and our battles with sin, our struggling through trials and our marriages, and our parenting. And God, we want to see your glory. We want to see your power at work among us. We don't want to be content with just the status quo. So we are asking you right now, please, please lead us with your vision in the days ahead. Please help us. Help us to aim for your glory above all else. Help us to align with your purposes above anything that is right in our eyes. And as we trust in you, we pray that you would work among us in power, in ways that cause us to sit back in awe and say, the Lord, he is God, and cause many others in Washington, D.C., and many others around the world to sit back and say, the Lord, he is God. May that be the fruit of years ahead in McLean Bible Church, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So, so what's our map here at Tyson's? How are we planning to carry out this mission? And I wanna close with this. Just a, I'm gonna put a picture on the screen that summarizes the map. So picture it like I was drawn out map for my in-laws. Here's the drawing. And by the way, this doesn't come out of isolation. This is not me or a couple of people going into a room, coming out, saying, here's what we're going to do. But what I'm sharing with you is the fruit of hours and days and months of praying and discussing and debating and listening and learning with members and leaders and elders in the church. All the things that we see in Proverbs are important for making wise decisions. So here's the map. Uh, picture the individual member of this church. So you, me, any one of us, uh, so picture yourself in a sense. Uh, our aim is to work so that every member of the church, there you are, I am. <laughs> our aim is to work so that every member of the church is cared for like family. I see. So that every single person says, yeah, I'm known and cared for. Is growing as a disciple. Like obviously we all go through seasons, but we're all growing in Christ and making disciples on mission. This is what we've created for. We don't want to get to the end of our lives and look back and have missed the point. So how do we get there? How do we get to where every member caring, growing, discipling? And as we've sought an answer to that question, we know there must be more than church simply being about a Sunday morning gathering in a large auditorium while children and students are in their respective programs. That's what we usually think of when we think of church, but don't miss the problem. We can do this pretty well, have good gatherings on Sunday, programs going on, and 11% of people feel known. And almost half of us not grow spiritually. And most of us not share the gospel. Like we need to change the way we're thinking about church. Which is why our hope in the days ahead, and I say days, I actually I mean years, so I'll go ahead and say we're, we're not going to be able to get here overnight. This is going to be a process. But our hope in the days, years ahead, is to help every member of this church to become a part of what I'm going to call on this map in the center of it, a church group. Now, I'm not 100% sure this verbiage is going to stick, but it's the simplest way at this point we know how to describe a group that carries out the functions of a church. A church group. A group that looks like the church. So last year at this time, we were in the middle of a series on 12 traits of a biblical church. And the beauty is we, we don't have to make up some way to care for one another and grow and make disciples of the nations. God's already told us how to do that. Be in community where there's biblical teaching and prayer, evangelism and discipleship, fellowship, including accountability and discipline, biblical membership, belonging, biblical leadership, biblical worship and ordinances, biblical giving, biblical mission. When those things are happening, people will be Known and cared for, growing, making disciples. That's the way God's designed the church. So we want to work to see every person in this church part of a group where these things are happening, such that when you think of church, you primarily think of this group. 
Now, the reason I'm not using small group or community group or fellowship group language here is because we have those kinds of groups all across the church, and many of them are great, but admittedly, many of these groups have not necessarily been designed to carry out all these functions of a church. And what we want to do in the days ahead is to help those groups grow in these functions. So maybe you have a group that focuses on Bible study but doesn't really do fellowship, accountability, and discipline. Together, we want to help that group grow in those areas. You may have a group that does fellowship with one another well, but doesn't really dive into the word. Or maybe you have a group that does fellowship and Bible study well, but not really mission together, and on and on. So we want to help current groups grow in these 12 traits, and we want to start new groups that are designed around these 12 traits. And oftentimes, groups are, are same gender, or same generation, or even same ethnicity, but we want to cultivate as much as possible groups that represent intergenerational, multi-ethnic community, what we value as a church. Now, in order to start new church groups, we need leaders for those groups, and that doesn't happen overnight. So this fall, we're gonna start something called Church Group Intensive to help train leaders and members for church groups. And the commitment bar for that is gonna be pretty high. You can find out more information about this in your bulletin today. There's actually a quick 30-minute meeting right after the service in the glass room at the back of the lobby, if you're interested. If you can't make that, there's, there's more times. You'll see there in your bulletin. But again, don't think microwave here. So it's not, here's the new program we're starting this week. Think smoker. So how are we gonna work together over time to strengthen current groups in the 12 traits and start new groups around the 12 traits? And Lord willing, grow and multiply those groups over the coming years. And what we're planning to do is surround those church groups in four ways. NBC Connect, well, we are going to work hard to connect people in this big body to a group where they can be cared for and grow and make disciples on mission. I hear it all the time. It's such a large church. I don't even know how to get connected. And this is where we have a lot of room to grow. We want to do this well. Connect people into groups. We want to worship. So NBC worships at our Sunday gatherings. Supplement what's happening in those groups. In other words, the Sunday gathering is not the center here. Instead, it's the people you're caring for growing together, making disciples with on mission. That's the center. What we do on Sunday supports that in this larger group. NBC training, we want to help each other when it comes to marriage and parenting, counseling through hard issues. How do we use money to the glory of God? How do we share the gospel in this situation, that situation? So the primary place where we'll train like a gym is week in and week out in church groups, but then as we face unique challenges, we'll have biblical, practical training that supplements what's happening in church groups. And finally, NBC Outreach, where we'll focus on not just how we're making disciples day in and day out, right, where we live and work and play, that's what the church group is for, but we'll think about what this looks like when we cross barriers in the city and go places around the world where the gospel hasn't gone in ways that fuel planting and multiplying churches. So that's a summary of the map. There's so much more to unpack in the days to come, including how this coincides with ministry to children and students. How do we faithfully pass the gospel on to the next generation? In fact, we're having some meetings over the coming weeks where you can learn more if you want. We know one thing we need to greatly improve on as a church is our communication in the church. So I want to point you to these meetings. Some of you who are leaders are already thinking about how you can strengthen your group. That's great. First, we want to invite you to an information session just for leaders on June 29th. Information about that is in your bulletin. And there's a gathering for any members here at Tyson's on July 13th. Again, you'll see all the specifics in the bulletin. We just ask that you register if you want to attend those. And then we're going to ask you to watch some videos before you come so we can make the most of that time. There's a link to that information. That link actually leads to a whole other issue because we're in the process of redesigning our website around this map. And hopefully our website will be 100 times more useful uh, in the days to come than it is right now. But for today, I simply want us to have an overall picture of where we're headed and why? Because I want, but not just me, I trust we want every single member of this body to be known and cared for and experience the joy of walking with God, growing in God, and making the greatest news known in the world around us. I I remember my in-laws, I'd draw this map for them to go to Washington. And it was a good map. It was really good. I thought pretty helpful. I mean, I even had a little picture. It was great. You know what happened? 
They never went down to the district. They stayed at our house the whole time, which was fine. We enjoyed time with them, but they missed out on all that was done in the district. So you can have them out, but, well, here's the deal. I don't want to miss out. I don't want you, I don't want us to miss out. I, I'm not saying this map is perfect. It will likely be augmented along the way as we go. But brothers and sisters, let's go. I know, I know change is not easy. Rethinking things is not easy. It takes courage, but it's worth it. Why? Because God has designed us for so much more than what we're experiencing right now. I, I, I mentioned that if you are visiting with us, uh, I, I hope that today uh, you're encouraged. I was talking with some folks who are visiting from out of town in the lobby. I hope you're encouraged to think about the church you're a part of and how hopefully you can grow in these ways in the church you're a part of. If you're not a part of a church, we would love to have you be a part of this family as we grow in these ways together. And if you are not a follower of Jesus, there's a sense in which you're the primary reason we've walked through this together today. Because we want you to know and hear from us, and you've not been hearing it from us. And not even been seeing it in us, being the church that God's designed us to be. We want you to know. We want you to hear loud and clear, like week in and week out, that the God of the universe loves you. And even though we, you, have sinned against him, he has not left us alone in our sin. Even though we deserve separation from him forever, the God of the universe has loves you so much that he has sent his son Jesus to die on a cross for you, to pay the price for all your sins. Like today you can be forgiven of all your sins against God by trusting in what Jesus did on a cross for you. And we want you to hear that. Not rarely, if ever. We want you to hear that all the time from us because you're not guaranteed tomorrow now, you're not guaranteed to make it to Monday. And so we want to urge you to put your trust in Jesus today. Amen. And we want to live with that kind of urgency as a church. And we want to say we'll make whatever changes are needed for us to experience all that Christ has for us and so that you can hear all that Christ has for you. So let's, let's pray. Jesus, you are Lord of every one of our lives. and. We surrender to you. We pray that you'd help us to plan and strategize this week for your glory in our lives, every facet of our lives. And Jesus, you are Lord over McLean Bible Church. You're the chief shepherd of this church. You're the leader of this church. Not me or anybody else. You are the leader of this church. Jesus, we surrender to you. And we pray that you would help us to plan and strategize for your glory in the care of your bride and the growing of your bride to be all that you've created us to be and the spread of your gospel to the ends of the earth. So lead us as a church, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.